All right, so that's working the text editor and the web browser, and that's where we're going to spend uh, a good chunk of our time. That's where we're actually designing and building the email. Once we've finished going through a bunch of these loops, we're going to go through the next three, which are all part of actually doing the send. So the first thing before we actually send our email to any email clients we need to do is we need to inline all of the CSS. So emails need to ship with inline CSS in order to render correctly. But that definitely doesn't mean that you should write your emails with inline CSS. Using an inliner, you can put in your clean code and you can get your email ready code out. There's a couple of different options for this. Uh, we have an inliner that's free that we host on Inc. Uh, it's tested with the Inc framework and it works with all the components in the CSS you would write for Inc. Um, if you want to use one as part of your, like an automated build process, there's an open source tool called Premailer. It is a tool that you need to download and run. Uh, a lot of other projects rely on it. It is what powers the one that we have on Inc behind the scenes. Um, another one that works really well is Campaign Monitor's inliner. So Campaign Monitor is an email service provider. They have an inliner that's just publicly hosted, like the one that we have for Inc. And they also have one as part of their, uh, their paid service. So one thing we would warn you is a lot of the other inliners that are out there, they don't work really well. But I'll get to that. So using inline styles in development, it violates two main principles of software engineering. And I'll show you just a second what I mean by inline styles. So the first is don't repeat yourself. When you're writing uh, any kind of code, you don't want to repeat code over and over again. It should only be defined in one place. So here, for example, we have three TDs and we have a style attribute. And on that, we have the property font size 11, color red, font white bold, right? Uh, here we have to repeat it three times. If we had, you know, 40 of these TDs in the page, that's 40 places to be able to repeat that. And that's obviously a, a huge problem and it makes the email almost, you know, unmaintainable. If you change all these places, if you're used to writing regular CSS uh, using selectors and you would just define this in one place, you would target the selector for the TD that you want to apply the properties to and you would let it be applied like that. And so if you are familiar, so when we say inline CSS, this is what we mean. Inline CSS means CSS is defined in line to the element, not using a selector. It also violates the rule of just having clean code, right? If you have inline CSS, it blows out your, uh, your line width and your lines have to soft wrap. It becomes a huge disaster to maintain all this stuff, right? So this is an actual example of code. This isn't contrived where we have a table element that has class container and then it has all of these style attributes that are required to do a responsive email. So like border spacing zero, border collapse, collapse, vertical line, top, text align, hair at width, 580, margin zero, auto padding zero. You need all of these things, but then it makes the stuff absolutely unreadable. So we've seen a lot of emails that people write with inline CSS. And as soon as this CSS gets inline, you can't even read it anymore. People stop editing it. You can't find out where the tags start and where they stop. And it's kind of a huge disaster. If you're not using inline styles, it also lets you have shared styles such as a framework. So say for example, you're using ink and you write your email based on ink and the styles that it has with it. And then later you want to upgrade ink. If you've inlined the styles like this, there's no way you can upgrade that. Because if for example, we found that border collapse collapse is not the property that we want. We wanted something else. You have to update it across, you know, maybe hundreds of elements on the page. It's just not going to happen. So by writing your, your emails without inline CSS, you have the option to go back and just replace the CSS for the framework or for the style guide and be able to upgrade it. Uh, the same is true of saying maybe you have a style guide for all the emails in your company. So you have like your framework on the top, like you have that CSS file. And then below that, you have your company style guide. If later you want to make an update, you can come back and replace the CSS. As soon as you inline the CSS, it's not possible. Now, the reason that we see a lot of people writing inline CSS in emails is a lot of the inliners out there suck. Uh, and if you get burned once, you're probably not going to go through it again. So what an inliner does is it reads your CSS at the top of the page. It parses through all the selectors, and then it figures out where it needs to take those attributes and what elements it needs to apply them to by inlining them. It basically does the same thing the browser does, where when a browser reads your CSS, it has to figure out what are the properties, what are the precedence rules, and how am I going to apply those to different elements on the pages and work all that out. Uh, a lot of the inliners that we've seen that are part of email service providers, so uh, people that send email for you, a lot of them will say, hey, we have like a built-in inliner. A lot of those inliners are really basic. They just handle very simple things like simple classes and IDs. They don't handle more complex selectors or precedence rules. 
a lot of them don't handle uh, media queries, HTML attributes, attributes, and they're going to inline your CSS incorrectly. And then, like I said, once you have one bad experience like that, you're not going to use them again. So we see a lot of folks just write the CSS inline uh, to make sure that they know that it's going to work, right? However, if you use one like the one that we have in Ink or you use Premailer, it is going to work. Uh, the technology has come a long way in the last couple of years. Premailer, I think three years ago, did not support media queries, did not support advanced selectors. It wasn't the best. Um, but now it supports all those tools. They have a great team over there maintaining that. It's open source. And a lot of the good inliners today uh, are using that. So, uh, like I said, use the one on Ink, use Premailer, use inliner.cm. Uh, if you're going to use anything else, make sure you test it uh, very carefully before you, you ship production code using the inliner. So that's inliner CSS. There's really no development here. It's just something that, that has to get done. Uh, if you don't inline the CSS and you just ship it in a style tag, it is, the styles are not going to be applied uh, in Gmail, which is a little bit bizarre because you would think that Gmail is one of the more advanced uh, email clients, but it's not. Um, so until they add support for uh, CSS parsing in, in Gmail emails, um, you're stuck having to inline all your CSS. It's just how it is. Okay.